Everywhere inside there was dark wood and books, paintings and sculptures by artistic movements Anson had never heard of. Most of them looked like abstracts to him, churning storm-like colors. Any motion fell through freeze-framed angles, multiplied in shadows around corn shattered around corners that were not there. He recognized none of the artist's signature. The sitting room in the hallway smelled of baking. She offered him coffee, which he was too much of a college student not to take, and apple cider cookies, which he was too newly a college student to feel comfortable accepting, as if she were some friend's grandmother inviting him back into childhood. Families take care of family, she said mildly, after he thanked her for the third self-conscious time. When she met his gaze directly, her eyes shine flared white as a mirror. She had known his mother, she said, although he never knew if she meant in the flesh or in dreams. For so many of his family, there was so little difference between the two. For the first six months, he had dreamed of his mother nearly every night. He had known even then that it was not the true communion of his siblings, who could already compare details of never drowned in honey clay, phosphorescent spires and avenues of the city they would someday inherit. In the last weeks of the life ashore, Leonor Penders had lain most of the day in a cloth hooded bathtub filled with cold water and commercial marine salt. The thick carmine fronds of her gills opened and pulsing eagerly in the currents stirred by her own restless hands, pressing clawed and wedged to the last joint. Sometimes she ran the shower, equally cold, adding salt from the steadily depleting bucket on the bath mat. The scales would come in with the slick, glistening wet nori, but all of her family had cut, had cut their fingers on them by the end. For days after they had gotten back from the ceremony, the indigo shingled house on 63rd Street had smelled of standing water and drying salt, the sulfurous funk of decaying seaweed and sharper iodine and brine. Anson could still remember the one sound she had made as the water spit which bay closed over his head. And over and over he saw her in dreams of the fantastic mermaid she had never become, which never would, so long as the sea endured. She was pearl-bellied, with a deeply cleft tail of a siren, spangled green as a flapper's last beaded dress. She was blue-skinned and orange-scaled, flaunting as a tropical wrasse. She was raised and spined like a lion's face, carrying in human hands a pair of scallop shells written closely all over the log of the undersea, tiny snail tracks that glimmered and changed as he tried to read along. She was the young woman he knew best from photographs, laughing in studio apartments, her hair as dark and tousling and bracken. She was craving the crescent moon in, in a dripping web of algae to her breast. He woke each time with a hard knot of anger in his chest, fought with his siblings, fought with his father, cut class one morning in early November, and walked off all the way to Pinole Point, imagining he could feel the fault lines of the continent grating and shifting beneath his feet as he crossed from autumn dry tall grass to small bark and sedge, and pickle reddening like Indian paintbrush. He watched the water until late afternoon, but only turns and clovers came to meet him at the edge of the mirror blue waves. The bus to Richmond came late, and he took the bar home. He knew the sacrifices, the scriptures, the rites that marked the year as casually and surely as his father's side of the calendar, or in the case of the fish bath in the days of awe. He was not sure how much any of them helped. At school, his teachers treated him with uncomfortable sympathy. At home, Ron Penders, who had married his wife once with wine and seven blessings, and once with cups of seawater and blood, refused to sit shiva for a woman who would never die. Beth spent hours in the upstairs bathroom as if something her mother still resonated there within the pale blue walls and the white cast iron. Garen hoarded her books in marine biology and papered the walls above his bed with painstakingly hand-copied anatomies. Hanson told his dreams to none of them. To Solange Adair that spring, for the first time to anyone, he said, no, not for real. I've never dreamed of any of them. All that spring and into summer, as he stayed on after the semester's end with a part-time job at the Boston Book Annex and a jerry-rigged bedroom and a triple-decker fire trap in Brighton, he visited the row house on Pinckney Street with the other sea strays who came and went in her home as though it were their own. Claw fingers, solitary Isabel Wardy Lau, whose father was older than the destruction of Akrotiri, stargazing Lillian Perry, whose sea thirst is had sprung up halfway through a law scholarship to the University of Chicago, and Tony Woodhouse, a talkative KG Tusk student with a night shift collar and bottle brush black hair, dressed perpetually in t-shirts for Boston bands he was just too young to have seen. He was wearing one for sale in 66 the first time Anson saw him, folded like a piece of elastic into the narrow cushioned window niche with a pamphlet copy of Swinburne's by the North Sea. The night he fell asleep on Anson's floor, he was advertising Mission Burma. You're different, he pronounced, before the three beers and half a bomb caught up with him, sprawled like a starfish on carpet, the color of the rain-stained walls. 
one finger pointing at Addison as though he were making a note for himself in the morning. You don't hear it calling. Only slightly less buzz, Hanson has sorted. No, I hear you talking, man, and you're pretty loud. And the conversation had drifted away with the gray wash of dawn, and Anson needing to pull himself piecemeal out of bed in order to shell pop art and poetry at the annex. If anyone else at Salon has agreed with Tony's observation, they never told him. He'd like to think it would not matter. There was a sea smell in her house now, familiar as a shadow. And then in June, it ended, as suddenly and firmly as it had begun. Under the full moon of the solstice, it was Solange at Air's time to go down to the sea with the blood of fishes and the blood of humanity painted on her brow and her palms, anointing each stickle and barbel and sharp-edged fin as the wave ter waves turned against the sea-chewed stubs of piers and spilled between the tumbled granite boulders of Innsmouth's long-abandoned quarry, paving the tide's road for the land-sprung soul to follow and the witch-like tail of the low last binding reefs. With, a, with one arm around Isabel's shoulders, Anson felt the claws tensing through his shirt where her arm circled his waist and said nothing even when she drew blood. He could not tell if she shook with sorrow or eagerness, the moon like mercury in her eyes. Tony was a stranger in a good shirt and a tweed jacket, the once not slouching. In the driftwood light of the shore fires, the bracelet coiling on Lillian's wrist ran against his dark skin like a meltwater with pearl. Solange made the same noise as his mother as the waters took her in. He did not know if it was the sound of pain or welcome this time either. He went home to Oakland the next summer, carrying among his dorm room possessions three books from Solange's library and an oil painting from 1919, a vortices ocean and harsh malachite and the salt white of tumbled bone. He did not dream then or ever of Solange there. Actually occurred to me I was home to look back on it. 
You dream the water where your hand in flesh tatters to bloody slides in the sun. The battlefields stink like a butcher's sewer, and the shock display of no man's land garlands the mud with boots, cloth, corks that prepared to a clenched jaw grin. A knife blade speckles trout like with rust. A china head rattles like a dice cup with glass eyes within. Dainties discarded in a drawer at home where letters tied with red ribbon leaf prints now. A clock tick, a rat's foot whisper. And I dreamed the night before the last came, stained with earth like a sexton and in another man's hand. The shell casing, the shrapnel I picked from a flooded ditch. A watch blade, watch face, splinters to half past ten, and then the sunset soaks to Mars. The beheaded, the detonated, the flayed, the impaled, gathered in my wake like a murder to the gallows, pilgrims to the cross, a cluster of bullets like bruises in my hand. The mortar flares, the silence, the wasted land. The same dream kicks and sways with the wind each night by graveside or candlelight. I plant red poppies and dog roses, and the children play with blind dolls and pocket knives, crying rhymes of prose. The dead I could not harrow, the words I never wrote. For the last letter I unfolded with your smile on my face, blasted, blown open, unsurprised. Persu is the Etruscan word cognate to Latin persona. It means a face or a mask. I really, really like Etruscan art. <laughs> so they teased us when we married, the stone cutter and the daughter of Augury, Karen and Zan. The hammer I swung into skulls of Tufa and Travertine, her huntress's step suddenly turning as if she beckoned back the soul of Paris with nine. We wore the names lightly, the lines of our days already in the hands of other gods. The laws of Tarchaeus, Swan wings turn. Thesson, cradling slain Memnon in her arms, was not more piercing than her eyes like laurel leaves, the plaited caramel of her hair black as Bucero in the reflected sun. No cast of tinias, no liver or leaven bolt that split us. We held on we held to one another like pole star and plowman, Mundus and Matt, crossing our shadows, the years nailed home. In the tomb where she rests among garlands and funeral games, Panthers guard her, twin lionesses. Case, a rack of red dashed ivy dappled like palm. An owl and a boy's fixed fingers play the melodies only the dead can hear. As in life, she lifts a hand to me, terracotta in the dark of my closed eyes, the solid compass of the heavens overhead. Out of reach, one of my guides is waiting. The death I would greet gladly wears her face. Domagoya came back is the title of a pendant by Louis Matheson, which I named the poem after having no expectation of owning it. And then Joe Walton bought it for me. <laughs> and, and it arrived in the mail from Elise earlier this year, and is now sitting on a shelf, very far out of reach of cats. <laughs> <laughs> I have no explanation for this poem at all. I saw the title, and it came into existence very suddenly, and my only explanation is that, like, years of reading Russian futurist poems <coughs> my head. So I like to blame on much of them. I left the night, the jazz, the paper circus with its sawdust of madly loved lines. Its ringleader, that boy who wore his suicide like a rose stuck in his lapel, winking through the bottom of every glass. We were so cold together, eating fire, waiting for the world's wrists to run with ink. Dumb boy, all my poems are fatherless. The mouth he kissed was a drowned in fantasy. What do you write with in a stranger's bed? I know these empty sheets, these backward, this backward falling light, this stove where my shaking fingers slowly warm. And the poet who translates these words to a city where the street lights pulse with gin instead of vodka, instead of brandy, wine, will mistake you, Don Boy, for a metaphor, will mistake me for someone who could stay. Alexander, 
much more practicing. So I like to think that if the moon ever spoke to her, it would have been in her own language. Sattva with violets in your smile, why lie awake counting the Pleiades? Why pace the great shore with the sea hissing lost lovers? In my arms are warmer than the white waves, the sweet and sharp of your skin like crowning and wine. Come here to me and I will leave my husband dreaming, the stars to circle in the wandering sky. My hair darkened in the shadow of your hand, but yours is blue silver, shining like the foam of the morning you eat, not angels singing in that bright pleasure of days. And this is the poem goes to which I wrote the night before my marriage. It's a great poem. We visit each year the stations of our dying. The red line plowing its curves into the dark. The Charles sidling duck weights and drowns tires and hands the mourners at a memorial coffin side. That hot room where dreams stuck like a window. That bed where sheets drifted like snow. Our ghosts are lying still, staring at the cracked plaster of unhung pictures and close-ups, empty and bottled with ether. There the dust on the wall, the flash powdered shadows, still holding up their hands out for something that dressed like the future, broke like the past. Rust smudge book flakes, collapsing cardboard. Light is easier to reach for streaking from lost constellations. Time thumps pennies are less blank than your eyes. Your faces are ours if we fear them, or only as we knew we were. We go back each year, hand in hand over the bridges, the rattling tracks and bending river. Pilgrims without penitence to graves we do not lie in, rummaging chains and blood not to bury we trace our deaths to each last wearer, each alley strong, each anguish of the crowd seasons dispersed, all in our pockets without fire, without bread, our only song the one we sing each other. We brush their eyes closed, softer than a child of sleep. We open their windows, we leave their doors ajar, we say our names to the shade we are no more. In each other's arms, we hold tight the passage to take from hell to the outer entities, across the Atlantic. Sidewalks of Mandela, our ghosts behind us, fading into stars. <laughs>